Hello and welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith, and this week I'm joined by co-host Jay Shabbat to discuss the latest developments at JetBlue and Valaris. Hi, Jay. How's it going? Good, Gordon. How is everything for you this uh, fine April day? Well, we're recording Wednesday as normal, and we are in the thick of earnings season. We're up to our up to our eyeballs, and we've got lots of other news stories pushing around the the skift in airline weekly newsrooms. But uh, yeah, we're doing well. That's what we journalists enjoy. We like a busy news day. Oh yeah, there's there's nothing as exciting as earnings season for sure. A whole lot of new information coming in, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what we live for, right, Gordon? Uh, yeah, we're top 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 three. Let's we'll, go. We'll spare forward. we'll spare the audience the other two. Let's look at uh, JetBlue first of all, Jay, and we're going to come to Valaris. Uh, in a moment, or rather in part two, give us your top line take. What do our listeners need to know about uh, JetBlue, an airline that I dare say has not exactly been out of the headlines in the past few months? Right. Uh, it, it's a very bad situation. Is That's the uh, the headline. Uh, the operating margin, which is, uh, if you've been listening to this podcast or been reading Airline Weekly, you'll uh, be That'll sound familiar. We we look look at that a lot. The operating margin. That's how we compare across different airlines. And they were at negative seven percent, excluding some. There's a bunch of special items related to the Spirit merger and whatnot that uh, were taken out there. But negative seven percent, which is, which is pretty rotten. They did negative six percent last year's uh, first quarter. And just if you want to compare it to the first quarter of 2019. Uh, they actually had a positive five percent. So something is uh, rotten in the you know in the state of New York or uh, however you want to uh, describe it. I'm sure there's a big apple analogy we can use. Yeah, yeah, I was trying to think of an apple. Analogy. But uh, in any case, yeah, and uh, and they're where, wherever they are, it's uh, it's not a pretty picture. Um, they have, uh, of course, uh, disappointed that the uh, the spirit merger was blocked by uh by the powers that be um and there's uh, a whole bunch of other things going on too as well as exposure to the the airbus a321 neos that they badly need and badly want they're just not getting them or the ones that they a lot many of the many of those that they have are grounded because of this uh geared turbofan engine issue so that's one big problem and another major problem is that their Latin American slash Caribbean routes are really under competitive assault. And they didn't specifically, they didn't, they didn't get too much in the weeds on, on exactly, uh, you know, where they were having trouble or why that was the case. But after digging through, you know, some of the schedule data, it becomes pretty, pretty clear that, de- <clears throat> that Delta is launching an all out war against them on some of their key routes and uh see if i can dig up some numbers for you here they have uh yeah just like for example so so jfk to san juan is their busiest caribbean route and delta's capacity on that route is up 12 percent. and uh, i believe that's just delta i have this is for all other airlines i believe just delta's on that um we can go down to like jfk aruba uh other airline capacities up 22%. I believe that's Delta as well. Uh, JFK to Punta Cana up 73%. So they're really having, um, and that's, I, I kind of picked the extreme examples there. Not all of their routes are, are, you know, seeing that kind of thing, but they're definitely feeling the capacity pressure on some of these routes uh, where they traditionally, you know, make a good amount of money. And uh, so, so there you have it. I mean, that's, that's another reason why JetBlue is, you know, really troubled right now some of the other airlines still in their lunch as we as, as we would say and yeah fascinating to hear from um marley st yep. george the relatively new uh, president of JetBlue. regular listeners might know his name from JetBlue, sort of pre-2019 i want to say jay um and then he left the company and then he he came back at the a couple of months ago now but uh yeah his his, his first sort of full uh earnings day as President, he said Latin America made up 35% of JetBlue's total capacity, but the industry capacity in the region had increased by 60% since 2019. So a huge amount of pressure on what was traditionally quite a lucrative part of the world. 
for JetBlue. Jay, what would you say to listeners who are thinking, let's not be too tough on them? Q1's a tough quarter for everyone. Well, it's Q1 is traditionally a tough quarter, yes, but uh, for an airline like JetBlue, it should be less tough because they have so much exposure to the Caribbean and Florida, and these are markets that are supposed to do well in the first quarter. You know, when everybody's freezing cold up where I live in, uh, in the New York area, the Philadelphia area, and that's uh, that's when everybody's going down Boston. That's when everybody's going down to these places. So. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if you look historically, uh, I don't think that Q1, even for JetBlue is, is their best quarter. I mean, for example, like Transcontinental, just completely opposite. Transcon is, tends to be very bad in Q1, very good in Q3. So, uh, you know, let's not overemphasize it, but they, you know, if, if anybody's going to, let's put it this way, they shouldn't be losing money in Q1. Uh, yeah, especially under the sort of wider macroeconomic conditions that we've discussed previously on, on the podcast, Jay. Let's uh, touch, we, we, we mentioned right. the, the Pratt & Whitney gear turbo fan engine issue, which is affecting Spirit and Wizz Air and multiple operators globally. We should emphasize it's not just JetBlue, but they have been particularly hard hit, especially against the backdrop of everything else that's going on in terms of headwinds at the carrier. Um, I think on the, the earnings call, they said uh, around $200 million would be uh, received from uh, Pratt & Whitney. In terms of compensation payment, that's still uh, in the process of being reached, but significant sum and not too different from from that that we heard from Spirit uh, a week or so ago. Do you think that these compensation payments are going to be enough to to make up for the disruption caused? No, not not. It's I haven't heard anybody that thinks that uh, these will uh, adequately compensate in full. I mean, it's helpful, but uh, you know I, what tends to happen is. Pratt and Whitney will just give you a credit on uh, future, you know, future engine payments. So it's um, it, it doesn't make up for all that. I mean, think about just all of the uh, you know the hiring that JetBlue had to do to uh, you know expecting these aircraft to be there, and then they're not there. So suddenly you're overstaffed, and that affects your unit cost. And then the fact that you uh, you know perhaps scheduled flights you know many months in advance and whoops well we can't operate those flights anymore because we don't have the planes so now you're upsetting customers and your you know your service takes it takes it so if you add up all the costs you know the the intangible costs the second order effects it's it's hard to imagine that uh the compensation would uh you know adequately address what the the, the pain that they're really feeling sure and then speaking of costs uh jet blue put a number on uh, some of the retirement of the regional fleet. So anyone that's flown with them before might have been slightly surprised to be on a, a sort of regional Embraer E-190 when they were maybe expecting a a larger gauge Airbus aircraft. But there's, a, there's, a, there's still a decent number of uh, 190s in the fleet being uh, replaced now by the, the Airbus A220. Uh, JetBlue said that they were able to save $70 million on maintenance costs through the accelerated retirement of the regional fleet and expect those savings to increase to $100 million by the end of this year. So big money in getting those older aircraft, less efficient aircraft, uh, out of their portfolio, Jay. Right. And that's that's long overdue. I mean, those A E-190s date back to, uh, you know, an order made by David Nealeman very early in the company's history, and uh, probably a, a, an airplane that uh, really didn't belong in the JetBlue fleet. I mean, it's that was probably, you know... I'm, stays perhaps others have a different view but i but i, I think that's uh that was a, a very poor investment on their part and uh you know we're just reaching the point now when they're where they're you know starting to exit the uh exit the, the fleet and the a220 seems to be you know much better fit for them uh and uh yeah so you know we'll see once they're they're obviously making making big changes i mean they will eventually get you know, all the 321 Neos they want. They'll eventually get the E190s out and all the A220s in. They'll eventually, uh, you know, or they'll eventually, you know, or the idea is anyway that they'll, you know, bear some, get get some rewards from all these uh, capacity cuts they've been doing. I mean, they've been downsizing pretty dramatically at LaGuardia Airport, for example. And, you know, one sort of side benefit of that is you're saving on very expensive real estate costs by, you know, not, not using as much terminal space, for example, in LaGuardia. So they are making, um, you know, the new management team uh, making, you know, pretty 
pretty I don't know if dramatic is the quite the right word, but they're but they're making um they're making moves that uh, that should have some impact in the future. And you know, big question is you know how long how long before the ship turns. On the topic of LaGuardia, Jay, slightly off piece. Have you been through the new Terminal B? Believe it or not, I have not been to the new LaGuardia at all. I've been there in years. Oh wow! Okay, never mind the never mind the new terminal. Just uh, one one that doesn't reach your uh, reach your needs, I guess. If you're uh, if you're living close enough to New York, but not that close enough. Right, right. Well, Philadelphia is my home airport now. I used to sure. live within walking distance of LaGuardia Airport. That was many years ago, um, in the very early days of Airline Weekly. But uh, that is, uh, yeah, I just haven't had the occasion to to fly uh, out of LaGuardia, and probably the last time was, oh, I don't know, the late 2010s. I'm not sure. Did you ever actually walk to the airport for a flight? I used to take the bus. That's uh, you couldn't okay. quite cross the big highway, but uh, I just, you know, I say that for a fact. It's so close that I could walk, but uh, but there was the old Q33 bus from my old neighborhood, Jackson Heights, that took you right there. So it was a matter of minutes. The only faithful. Jay, let's just touch uh, briefly on JetBlue's European ambitions because. And, and by the way, Gordon, sorry to uh, just one more thought about that is um, that old that neighborhood I just mentioned is uh, just just a stone's throw from JetBlue's headquarters. That's in uh-huh. Queens, New York. Yeah. And that's uh, they're over, uh, I believe, in is it Woodside? I'm not sure. Long Island City, I think, is where they are in Queens, New York. And uh, um, LaGuardia is not not too far from there either. A little, little bit okay. further, further out east. Uh, yeah, well, you can't get from the Guardia to to Europe, at least not on JetBlue directly, but you can from JFK and from Boston. What do you make of uh, JetBlue's European ambitions? It sounds like the movie music is starting to change, and they've they've gone into Paris and they've gone into London, Heathrow, Gatwick, Dublin recently on a seasonal basis, Edinburgh, I think, to join next month, Amsterdam as well, if my memory serves me correctly. But the, the, the movie music sounds like JetBlue have pretty much done everything they want to do in europe at least for the time being is, is that your impression as well jay it is yeah and if you a few months ago i mean if you asked me this question you know late 2023 i um i was under the impression that these european routes are probably pretty pretty decent for JetBlue because uh we knew from other airlines that uh, transatlantic markets were just really really booming you know with the dollar being strong uh then i saw and the economy being strong then I saw some load factor numbers that look really alarming on some of the routes that they fly over to Europe. And uh, that made me kind of think that, oh, maybe this is not as, uh, you know, not as much of a success as I, I thought. Uh, and, you know, in yesterday's call, they kind of, uh, I think the message was, uh, yeah, we've, you know, the premium is doing doing well. The routes are, the routes are okay, particularly in summer. As, as you kind of alluded to, Gordon, where, you know, they're, messages that you know maybe we're not we're going to slow this expansion down maybe we're going to uh make some of these routes seasonal stop flying them in the winter i think they're already is is, is that some of the new stuff is it edinburgh edinburgh and dublin or is that just seasonal yeah edinburgh is certainly seasonal and i think maybe one of the dublin routes i think they've got two dublin routes maybe okay. seasonal. don't quote me on that but Edinburgh in November is a very different place to Edinburgh in August. Uh, speaking speaking as a Scotsman and as someone who studied there for four years, it's, you, uh, oh, you would know. It's a, it's a wonderful city all year round, and I would encourage everyone to visit if they've got the the means and the and the will to do so. But uh, yeah, you can see why if you were being a ruthless network planner that it might lend itself to a a, a seasonal route. Right, and and remember too, I mean, London is very you know very big part of uh, JetBlue's. Uh, international ne- European network, and I don't know what percentage of ASMs are probably probably pretty sizable percentage. And uh, I think London, um, it's probably. I mean, we know not even probably. I mean, it's, it's pretty certain that uh, the leisure demand between the U.S. And, and London, particularly from the U.S. to London, has been very very strong. Um, but that's also a market with a lot of corporate traffic that maybe you know hasn't come back yet or is not flying JetBlue because, you know, that's so dominated by the BAA Alliance and the Delta Virgin Alliance. And because it's kind of interesting because you have, because there's there, there also such big business markets, these joint ventures have to provide a lot of frequency for the business travel traveler. And that creates a lot of capacity. 
So if you're just competing for the leisure component, as JetBlue is, or you know maybe some small business, you're it it, it makes it a little bit harder. There's probably more capacity in that market than 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 you'd like, um, and maybe that that's an issue for them. So I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll see where it goes. I mean, we've got the upcoming summer peak uh, just around the corner here. Um, it's a little bit late for adding anything new at this stage. I mean, you could, but you know some of these. Uh, you know, some of these flights tend to tend to book a, quite a few months in advance. Advance, but uh, we'll see if they make any moves for next summer. Now, of course, you know the big cloud hanging over this is, uh, or the big question mark hanging over this is, you know, will they get the Airbus planes to do this? <laughs> you know, that's. Uh, I think they would have loved to have more, you know, LR the longer range versions, and ultimately the extra long range versions, which open up, you know, a whole new sort of a whole new window for them, a whole new set of opportunities over across the pond. So uh, keep an eye on that. Yeah, absolutely. I wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago now that JetBlue were having to use the non-LR 321 for the uh, Dublin route. So that meant no hot food options for their economy core passengers. I remember uh, you because they, that, yeah. The, the galley simply didn't have space uh, to accommodate all of the, the hot food options available. Those in their uh, premium cabin and mint uh, were still offered the, the hot food and still hot drinks and other bits and available. But the, the prospect of even for payments, no hot food on what can be actually an eight-hour flight, depending on the winds and the direction, uh, raised a few eyebrows, let's say. So, so, now, so now you got to go to Scotland in January and you're cold and you're hungry. Well, the, the, the cold food options did look pretty good, actually, in that okay. defense. But uh, yeah, certainly... No hot meals, at least. Uh, Jay, so much more we could discuss with JetBlue, and I'm sure we will revisit the topic in the not-too-distant future. But let's have a uh, brief pause. We'll be right back in part two, and we'll be discussing uh, all things Polaris. Don't go away. Hello, and welcome back to the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. I'm your host, Gordon Smith, and I'm joined by co-host Jay Shabbat. We've been discussing all things JetBlue in part one, and now we are going south of the U.S. border to Mexico and talking Valaris because we've had some some interesting numbers out of uh, out of that airline as well, haven't we, Jay? Yes, and the first quarter this year was uh, happens to have been very good for Valaris. So it's uh, the uh, this is the good news part of the podcast. We we talked about the JetBlue in, in a way that perhaps uh, you know. Was not very uplifting, but uh, this this part of, this is a good news story. Ending so, on a high, yeah, we're going to end on a high. Volaris actually had a a fourteen percent operating margin, uh, and that's unusual for them to to do so well in the first quarter. Now their earnings, you know, historically have been kind of yo yoing up and down, but uh, if just for comparison, in the first quarter of twenty twenty three, they last year they they lost money. They had a negative four percent operating margin. So you know the what happened. Uh, so one, I think right off the bat, we have to just clarify that this year's first quarter uh, featured Easter, the Easter holiday, um, which is a very, very big travel period in Mexico. So that helped, um, whereas last year it fell in the second quarter. So, you know, keep that in mind. The second quarter this year, you know, might not be as as good as it was last year because of that, you know, it doesn't have, won't have Easter. So there's the Easter shift issue. Uh, but more interestingly, the Mexican market is um, only has three airlines. So Volaris, uh, just so everybody knows, this is uh, an airline owned by the same investment firm, Indigo Partners, that owns Frontier Airlines in the U.S. and also Wizz Air uh, in Europe. And for that matter, there's another Chilean airline down in South America called uh, JetSmart. They own that as well. But Volaris um, is an ultra low cost carrier. And it competes with really just two other Mexican carriers now. So it's Aeromexico, and we have uh, Viva Aerobus, which is another very similar to similar bot business model to Volaris, the kind of you know ultra low cost type model. Um, it's really just three. There's a new military run uh, airline, which I don't think deserves any of our time. <laughs> it's a bit a bit of a joke of an airline, but uh, we'll ignore that. But those, uh, so it's a triopoly essentially, um, not too different than Brazil for that matter, which is its own triopoly. Um, so just three airlines for a free, for, for a pretty big country. Um, so that's one reason why the supply side situation there, 
precarity like Polaris is, is rather benign these days. Um, the other big uh, supply side fact we have to consider is that all three airlines are facing very serious aircraft shortages. So Volaris is very much a uh, GTF carrier, meaning they fly the Airbus Neos with the Pratt & Whitney gear turbofan engines, which uh, require these inspections that uh, are taking like a you know a, a year to get done, and they're there. A lot of them are just. I listened to the uh, Pratt & Whitney, their parent company had their earnings call this morning, and they talked about how they have you know planes just they planes just sitting around waiting for maintenance. Uh, they don't have you know the mechanics uh and the uh the the space in these maintenance facilities to actually get to all these planes so um big big uh shortage of aircraft now viva has the exactly the same problem they have the gtf powered neos as well and their aero mexico last quarter um had all of these max issues so they have i believe they have the max nine right gordon i do that off of my head i believe they have max nines so they had they were um affected by the grounding, uh, and then they had some delivery delays. So you can see why the yields would be rather high in a situation like that where capacity is so constrained. Uh, and the final um, note I will make about Volaris is that Mexico recently had uh, what they call a Category 2 designation from the US FAA removed, and that basically limited for kind of on safety grounds on uh, the FAA basically audits uh, every country's uh, you know their, their aviation safety protocols and, and whatever and if they're not happy they'll they'll put you in a sort of category this or that and so they were kind of in a you know category that limited Volaris and, and the Mexican carriers from expanding in the US well that's gone now so if you look at what happened last quarter, I remember this in the context of Valeris not having all the planes they wanted to fly, but what they did with their existing fleet is they took their domestic network and downsized it by 27%. That's in AS terms. But then they took their international network, which is mostly the U.S., and they upsized that by 17%. So you can see a dramatic shift going on within the uh, Valeris network. Huge shift, uh, Jay. And again, for maybe listeners that aren't quite so familiar with the dynamics and the, the nuance of the, the U.S.-Mexico market, how much of this is is VFR, visiting friends and relatives uh, well, traffic? And, and how much of this is people, frankly, going down from the U.S. to, to Mexico for a good time? Yeah, for, for, well, it's, it's, it's those two things for sure. It's also some business. I mean, you'd be surprised that, uh, you know, there's a lot of business that's outsourced uh, to Mexico now, like U.S. companies. I mean, think of like Detroit's automakers or even the Asian automakers, for that matter, are doing a lot of their business in northern Mexico. So there, there's a lot of that, too. You know, there's a decent amount of business. For that matter, actually, there's, there's quite a bit of aerospace manufacturing, too, in like a city like Carretero, for example. Um, so don't don't estimate, underestimate that. But that market is mostly going to go to Aeromexico and maybe the U.S. carriers. So uh, for a carrier like Volaris and Viva Aerobus, it's mostly that first category you mentioned, Gordon, the uh, visiting family relatives. Uh, I have, I suspect that the leisure markets, I mean, if you think of, you know, U.S. down to Cancun and Cabo and those places, that I imagine is pretty dominated by the U.S. carriers because it's so U.S. point of sale. So if you're, you know, if you're taking a vacation from New York to Cancun, you're probably going to be flying American or Delta or JetBlue or something like that. So it's it's a lot a lot of VFR family visit. Got to get those loyalty points in. Uh, yeah. I remember I've only been to Mexico the once, but I flew Aero Mexico across the Atlantic from Heathrow to Mexico City, uh, and then we got a bit of touring around and overland uh, ground transportation, mostly buses, and then we did a couple of internal flights, and was, uh, one of them was on Interjet. Do you remember them? I sure do. Yeah, they're uh, they're no longer uh, with us, but uh, yeah. No, but I was secretly hoping to get on the the Sukhoi Superjet, which they operated for a while. The Russian. Remember, aircraft. I said they were they were no longer with us. I think uh, I think that has a connection to what you just said. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, they they foolishly. Uh, we talk about uh, you know David Nealman perhaps foolishly ordering E one nineties, but uh, that's on a whole different level of foolishness as Interjet ordering Superjet. You know. S, S, what is it, SSJ-100s? That was uh, 
not yeah. a uh, not the best idea in the playbook. No, but as an airline, I quite liked the brand and I quite liked what they were doing and yeah. being they're, relatively they're kind of like a, a JetBlue sort of that was that was sort of their business model in a way. Yeah, there was a, there was definitely a whiff of that. Uh, you, you felt like there were some some inspirations being taken from from JetBlue and others. Yeah, a little like upscale leisure kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, yeah, I, I, I was very impressed. I was I was sad to see them go when uh, they left the market. Uh, I think it was 2019, 2020. There was a sort of... Uh... Did they make... Yeah, I don't remember. Did they make it past COVID? I, I can't remember. I mean, like, it was were they gone before COVID? I can't remember. We'll have to Google that. But, yeah, um... they, 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 they quit flying all together in December 2020, and then bankruptcy, I think, started in 2021, the early, early part of that, when, oh, okay. when COVID so... was still very much a... A spectre hanging over the industry. So, Jay, uh, just looking much more broadly in some closing comments, low cost as a as a business format, obviously very mature in Europe, very mature in in, in North America. And by North America, I mean mainly uh, the US and Canada. In Mexico, Latin America, even in South America, as we've discussed on the podcast previously, it still feels like there's a lot of low hanging fruit, and it feels like the likes of Valaris and others are, are are there to pick it. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I think uh, it's always important to look at each market uh, and its own characteristics, you know, individually. Uh, obviously, with Mexico and Brazil is very much this way, as I mentioned. Uh, the the fact that you just have three airlines for these very very big markets uh, that is going to you know lend lend itself to airlines performing rather well financially. And that's, in fact, the case, despite we know goals in bankruptcy, but that's, you know, another story. That's that's more about, you know, not being able to pay past dues because of what happened with foreign exchange and whatnot, but a lot of peculiarities with those. But 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 the fact of the matter is, is that if you just look at the operating results of every Brazilian carrier, and I'd assume every Mexican carrier, we haven't gotten the Viva results yet, Aero Mexico doesn't do their results anymore because they're not publicly traded. But um, I suspect that all of these airlines on an operating level are just doing very well. Whereas in the U.S., it is a very different story. I mean, you have a lot of these low-cost carriers with such a sizable percentage of their capacity uh, stuck in markets that, like Florida, like Las Vegas, like the Caribbean, that just have been oversaturated with <laughs> with capacity really in the past. Remember that after uh, markets really started reawakening after the Omicron virus in the spring of 2022, it was, you know, everybody was rushing down to Florida and Vegas and, and Caribbean. And the the demand just, you know, pretty much held held pretty strong. And uh, for, you know, even, even today, I mean, I think the demand's pretty decent, but it's you know that was where the uh, it was like the sirens were ringing so everybody just just chased uh, chased uh, the the demand and threw a lot a lot of capacity in there and so we have carriers like JetBlue and Spirit and Frontier just really struggling and we'll see if they'll be able to get out of that by either you know adjusting their capacity or you know perhaps Caribbean Florida will rationalize I mean I think JetBlue said in their call that. Um, they expected the Caribbean and Latin to kind of get a little bit better in the second quarter. And it doesn't sound like, it sounds like they're disappointed that it's not. So I think there's maybe a longer, longer time to wait here. We'll see. The, the, and finally, last thing I'll say here, sorry to talk on so long, but now Southwest, now it's, that's very much its own animal as well, because it's so giant, so pervasive domestically throughout the U.S. Um, they had a, you know, very difficult year in 2023. I'm very eager to see uh, how they do. Uh, I'm sure by the time that Southwest they do report this week, right? Are they, uh, Gordon? I, I think uh, I don't have the dates in front of me, but I think by the time well, people they, listen, I think, to they might be, I think they might be next week. Are they? Are they next week? Okay, okay. So whenever they go, we'll uh, we'll get a you know a picture of, of, of how they're doing, um, and then maybe we can perhaps make some broader generalizations about low cost carriers in general. Uh, we haven't talked about. Uh, European low cost carriers or Asian low cost carriers, but uh, I think I'll stop there. That's for another day. We don't want to we don't want to treat our day. listeners too much. They'll be overwhelmed. 
Really appreciate your insights as always, Jay. Awesome to get your uh, thoughts and insights into what is just proving to be a, a fascinating earnings season. Before we go, a shameless plug for a LinkedIn Live event that I will be co-hosting uh, on May the 2nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. That's 4 p.m. for our uh, British listeners, 5 p.m. for anyone in Central Europe, uh, anyone in India, 8.30. Take your, take your time pick wherever you are. We will be there. Uh, and that's on May the 2nd, as I say. And we are going to be looking at the opportunities, but also the challenges of long-haul, low-cost airlines. Uh, I'll be joined by research analyst Ashab Rizvi. Uh, you might remember, if you're a regular listener to the podcast, uh, Ashab and I spoke on the subject a couple of weeks ago. This will be on LinkedIn Live. If you want any further details, if you want to register for the free event, go to uh, my LinkedIn page or Jay's LinkedIn page. Uh, that's Gordon Smith, Jay Shabbat, uh, and you'll find the invitation there. You'll skip the uh, event details on the Skift LinkedIn page. So plenty of options, no excuse to miss that. It would be great to see as many of you as can join. Jay, thank you for joining me. I will uh, let you go pick through further earnings and bits and pieces. Uh, Boeing has been reporting as we speak, so I'm going to tap in and see what uh, they had to say. Uh, if you've got any comments on the program, if you've got any ideas, suggestions, don't forget you can always contact us via email. My address is gs, that's g for Gordon, s for Smith, at skift.com. Jay can be reached at uh, js at skip.com. That's J for J and S for Shabbat. Airlineweekly.com for all of your uh, news between now and next time you hear from us. But uh, my thanks to Jay for joining me this week and wherever you are in the world. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out AirlineWeekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.